Correctional Policy for Offenders with Mental Illness, Creating a New Paradigm for Recidivism Reduction by Jennifer Scheme, Sarah Mancock, and Jillian K. Peterson. Published online 14th of April, 2010. Abstract offenders with mental illness have attracted substantial attention over the recent years given their prevalence of, and poor outcomes. A number of interventions have been developed for this population. Example, mental health courts. They share an emphasis on one dimension as the source of the problem, mental illness. Their focus on psychiatric services may poorly match the policy goal of reducing recidivism. In this article, we use research to evaluate the effectiveness of current interventions and B, the larger viability of psychiatric, criminological, and social psychological mo models of the link between mental illness and criminal justice involve involvement. We integrate theory and research to offer a multidimensional conceptual framework that may guide further research and the development of efficient interventions that meaningfully reduce recidivism. We hypothesize that the effect of mental illness on criminal behavior reflects moderated mediation, i.e. the effect is direct in the case of one subgroup, but fully mediated in another, and that the effect of mental illness on other recidivism is partially mediated by system bias and stigma. We use this framework to propose three priorities for advancing research, articulating policy, and improving practice. Depression are grossly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Comparing, compared to, that's weird, it starts in the middle of a sentence. Okay. Criminal justice system compared to the general population Oh, individuals with serious and often disabling mental illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression are grossly overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Compared to the general population, the current prevalence rate of these specific mental illnesses among jail detainees is higher for men by more than three times, 1.8 versus 6.4%. Teplin, 1990, and almost twice as high as for women. MW equals 10.6 versus 20.4%. Moreover, regardless of gender, nearly three out of every four jail detainees with serious mental illnesses have a co-occurring substance abuse disorder. These figures take on new meaning when considered in context. The number of people under correctional supervision in the USA recently re reached an all-time high of 7.3 million, Bureau of Justice Statistics 2009. Although prevalence estimates vary, a meta-analysis of 62 studies suggests that 14% of offenders suffer from a major mental illness. If so, then there are over 1 million individuals with mental illness in the USA, in jail, in prison, on probation, or on parole. Individuals with mental illnesses are not only disproportionately represented in the criminal justice system, they also are disproportionately likely to fail under correctional supervision. The vast majority of individuals in the correctional system, 70% are supervised in this community on probation or parole. Compared to their relatively healthy counterparts, probationers and parolees with mental illnesses are significantly more likely to have their community terms suspended or revoked. Based on a sample of 44,987 offenders, Eno Loudon and Scheme in press found that parolees with mental illnesses illness 52 to 62% were about two times more likely than parolees without illness to return to prison within one year of release, 30%. Together, these figures are sobering. They indicate that a large number of individuals with mental illness enter, 
enter the criminal justice system each year, and many penetrate deeply into the correctional system over time, as observed by the Council of State Government, CSG, the current situation not only exacts a significant toll on the lives of people with mental illness, their families, and the community in general, it also threatens to overwhelm the criminal justice system. The situation has attracted remarkable attention from policymakers and practitioners, especially those involved in the correctional facility. There we go. Has focused intently on addressing the situation. More recently, the CSG Justice Center 2009 has been leading an unprecedented national effort to help local, state, and federal policymakers and criminal justice mental health professionals improve the response to people with mental illness who come into contact with the criminal justice system. This laudable effort has brought together professionals and law enforcement, the courts, corrections, and mental health, identified and described programs across the USA for offenders with mental illness, and distilled the basic perceived root of the problem. With respect to the last point, people on the front lines every day believe too many people with mental illness become involved in the criminal justice system because the mental system has somehow failed. They believe that if many of the people with mental illness received the services they needed, they would not end up under arrest in jail or facing charges in court. Council of State Governments. In other words, the perceived root of the problem is criminalization of mental illness, deviant behavior that was once appropriately defined and managed within psychiatric framework has been inappropriately redefined and managed within a criminal framework. It is believed that because of deinstitutionalization, increasingly restrictive laws from involuntary psychiatric hospitalization and the inadequacy of the community-based psychiatric services, the nation's jails and prisons have become a de facto the nation's largest psychiatric hospitals, treatment advocacy centers, 2007, page one. When an individual with mental illness engages in deviant behavior that should have been prevented or managed through treatment, it is thought that the behavior is redefined in criminal terms by other agents or of social control, including the police. Typically, an individual would be arrested for minor deviant behavior, perhaps in an effort to secure treatment in jail. Occasionally, an individual would be arrested for violence that is the direct product of the person's untreated mental illness. For this population, the chief policy goal is reduced recidivism or exit from the criminal justice system because untreated mental illness is perceived as the reason for criminal justice involvement. Providing psychiatric treatment seems the logical way to end such involvement at the federal level. This is implied by the very name of the Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Crime Re Reduction Act, which authorizes funding for pro programs that target this population. Historically, access to effective mental health services has been cast as the linchpin to successful response. Indeed, virtually all contemporary programs are designed to link offenders with mental illness to community treatment services for this population. There has been a proliferation of case management services as the policy response. In general, the response focuses on one dimension, mental illness, criminal justice involvement is used to mandate or link the individual to psychiatric treatment. Example, a probationer is required to abide by special condition to participate in treatment and treatment is thought to reduce the risk of recidivism. Given that much needed advocacy for this population has promoted the wide dissemin dissemin dissemination of such programs as mental health courts, the time is ripe to assess the extent to which these programs are reaching the chief policy goal of protecting public safety. 
In this article, we distill evaluations of contemporary programs, place the results in the extent, context of relevant theory and research on the link between mental illness and crime, criminal justice involvement, and propose a conceptual framework that may help advance policy and interventions for offenders with mental illness. Our framework suggests that the effect of mental illness on criminal behavior reflects moderated mediation. The link is direct in one subgroup, but mediated by other factors in another subgroup. Our framework further suggests that system bias and stigma, not criminal behavior per se, plays a role in a community supervision failure. We conclude by proposing three specific research and practice priorities that expand the focus beyond mental health to explicitly embrace other dimensions and thereby better reduce recidivism for this population. Our focus is on the large class of adults with mental illness who have been convicted of crimes or arrested and diverted from jail rather than those deemed not guilty by reason of insanity and on general recidivism, although we also address violent recidivism, we emphasize the context of community corrections, probation, and parole rather than institutions, jail, and prison. Because most offenders are supervised in the community and the bulk of work on evidence-based corrections focuses on that context. To what extent is the current policy model working? Describing program Types. The most common types of contemporary programs for offenders with mental illness are shown in Table 1, which describes each program type, summarizes its underlying premise, and proposed solution, derived in part from Drain ETL 2007, and provides a program exemplar or prototype, as shown in Table 1. Four program types are derived from general criminal justice models, i.e. jail diversion programs, problem-solving courts, specialty probation or parole caseloads, and jail transition or prison reentry programs. These programs target a particular stage of case processing, e example, arrest, reentry, and or a special population. Example, mental health courts were derived from drug courts, although ongoing judicial and correctional supervision is an integral component of some programs, example, mental health courts. Others rely more exclusively on service brokerage, example, other jail diversion programs. Even though mental health courts are a specific form of jail diversion, i.e. specialty court-based post-booking, we disaggregate mental health courts from the larger class because they a involved ongoing judicial supervision and b have spread prolifically over recent years bureau of justice assistant bj bja 2009 is shown in the second column of table one criminal justice derived programs for this population are united by their emphasis on linkage with mental health services in the community as an essential component of their mission also shown in table one are the other two program types that are derivatives of mental health models forensic assertive community treatment fact and forensic intensive case management ficm fact and ficm are relatively intensive treatment models that may be used either independently or in conjunction with criminal justice derived programs example a mental health court fact and fic FICM were adapted in from the most extensively studied mental health service assertive community treatment act more CETL 2007 also as suggested by the com composition of table one treatment development efforts for this population have involved adapting ex ex existing evidence-based mental health services like ACT. See Osher and Studman 2007. That is services that have been shown to improve patients' clinical outcomes. Example, reduced hospitalization in contrast, evidence-based for correctional practices that have been shown to reduce offenders' recidivism have had little effect on practice for the for this population. Let me go ahead and 
I will do it like this so that you can do what's called a screenshot and you can, and then I will try and do it like this. It's kind of hard to read these. Should you wish to pause and take notes. Okay, and then I'll go ahead back here. Distilling evidence on program effectiveness. Our approach to distilling evidence on these programs effectiveness involved three steps. First, we focused on isolating studies of the programs defined in table one, given the widely diversity among programs that adopt a particular label, jail diversion, and the overlap among program types. We focus on a multi-site studies that simultaneously assessed multiple program exemplars and B studies of programs with features that were prototype of the target type and minimized overlap with other types. For example, we focus on studies of jail diverse, diversion programs that did not overlap with mental health courts. Second, we conducted a comprehensive search in both PsychoInfo and Medline for empirical evaluations of the effectiveness of each type of program. Because many of these programs have been shown to meet their basic goal of increasing access to psychiatric services, see Drain ETL 2007, we defined effectiveness in study in terms of the chief policy goal of recidivism reduction studies define recidivism differently. Example, as rearrest revocation of community supervision for any reason, i.e. a new crime or technical violation and reincarnation or re reincarceration for any reason, given our interest in the link between mental illness and crime and the larger pr policy priority of preventing new crimes and new victims. We specifically searched for studies that focused on the outcome of rearrest. We were also interested in studies that assessed whether program, a program's effect on recidivism is mediated by mental health services or symptoms reduction. When programs works, it, is that because it targets, it targets mental health? For each program type, we identified a handful of or small body of studies, the smallest for reentry programs, the largest for jail diversion and mental health courts. Third, we isolated the most rigorous study or studies for each program. We placed studies that randomly assign offenders to the program versus comparison condition at the top of the evidence hierarchy, given that experimental designs are the standard for drawing causal inference inferences about the effects of a program. For each program type, at least one experimental or quasi-experimental study was available. This allowed us to exclude single group pre-program, post-program studies, which can inflate the apparent effects of a program. We, sorry. Also tried to admit studies that exclude offenders who drop out of the program as this inflates apparent effectiveness. The evidence is summarized in the last column of table one and two. Table one describes the most rigorous or focal study available for the program, including effects of the program on recidivism and hypothesized mediator of symptom reduction because more than one rigorous quasi-experimental study had been published for two program types. Table two describes additional studies of jail diversion and mental health courts. What conclusions may be drawn from the evidence that we have identified and distilled in these labs or in these tables? First, there is a, at best a mixed evidence that these programs as a whole reduce recidivism. Second, the evidence base seems that weakest for the mental health based models, FACT or FCI, FICM, and for jail diversion programs, which vary substantially 
but also tend to rely heavily on case management, as summarized by Morrissey ETL 2007. The supporting evidence about the effectiveness of fact in reducing arrests and keeping people out of jail is weak. Moreover, there is no compelling evidence that FICM can produce positive results at a reduced cost. Page 537. Similarly, jail diversion usually increases time in the community as it diverts individuals from incarceration, but often has little or no effect on rates of rearrest. In fact, if participants in one jail diversion program, over one in five were re-diverted after a re-arrest within 18 months of their first diversion. Bhattachani, Christy Pythris, and Krishaw, 2005. Third, the evidence for recidivism reduction is mixed, but not quite as weak for criminal justice-based models that emphasize supervision by specialized courts or probation officers. Similarly, the one small study in our entire sample that included any emphasis on criminal thinking. Sachs ETL 2004 on evidence-based correctional practice. Pearson ETL 2002 looked promising. Let me go ahead and here is the table. Should you wish to pause and screenshot and I'll kind of get close so you can, if you want to take notes. Which path, which path should be followed? Now to maximize recidivism re reduction. Possibility number one, better implement the current policy model. Why are the contemporary programs for offenders with mental illness consistently and meaningfully not achieving their chief policy goal? One possibility is that programs vary in their fidelity to the basic policy model. Our review revealed no direct evidence for this model, i.e. that recidivism reduction is mediated by mental health services or symptom improvement. Still, this may be because programs often link offenders to mental health services that are ineffective or otherwise low quality. If so, then they miss an essential link in the model, i.e. criminal justice involvement provision of effective mental health services. Although in Intuitively, appealing this possibility rests on little evidence, first in experiments, then even evidence-based mental health services, i.e. those that reliably affect clinical outcomes, have not affected criminal justice outcomes. Based on a sample of 223 patients with co-occurring disorders who are were randomly assigned to ACT versus standard case management, 1999 found no treatment related difference in police contacts 80 percent and arrest 44 percent over a three-year period in another randomized controlled trial for patients with co-occurring disorders castlin yonker lemming morris and klinkenberg 2005 found no treatment related difference in arrest and incarcerations between those assigned to act Integrated Dual Diagnosis Treatments, IDDT, or Treatment as Usual. Similar results were obtained for a sample of offenders with co-occurring disorders who were randomly assigned to IDDT or Treatment as Usual, Chandler and Spicer, 2006. Given such results, scholars have cautioned that positive outcomes observed for evidence-based mental services example reduced hospitalizations, improved symptoms will not necessarily extend to criminal behavior and have called for interventions that specifically target reduction of criminal behavior. Second, there is no evidence for the current model's implied link between symptom control or reduction and reduced recidivism. According to existing data, offenders who, for whatever reason, show symptom improvement during a program for are no less likely to recidivate than those whose symptoms remain unchanged or worsen. Based on over a thousand participants in a multi-site jail diversion study, Stedman Dupius in a multi-site jail 
diversion study, excuse me, Stedman, Dubious, and Morris, 2000, found that no significant relationship between symptom reduction and the number of rearrests over time. Similarly, based on approximately 360 participants in a study of specialty probation, Scheme ETL found that trajectories of symptom change were unrelated to the probability of arrest or revocation over a year, one year period. Together, these studies cast doubt on the possibility that the problem lies with fidelity to the current policy model. Although some programs reduce recidivism, there is no evidence that they say that they do so by linking individuals with evidence-based psychiatric treatment or by achieving symptom reduction. Possibility number two, explicitly revisit and expand the current policy model. Given the available evidence, we believe that the most promising path toward improving outcomes for this population will require an extensive uh, explicit revision of the current policy model. If this model is inaccurate or incomplete, ev then even a program with excellent fidelity will not reduce recidivism. A viable explanation for the failure of modern programs to cons consistently meet their policy goal is that the criminalization hypothesis does not fully account for the link between mental illness and crime. <coughs> There is no evidence for the basic criminalization premise that decreased psychiatric services explain the disproportionate risk of incarceration for individuals with mental illness. Systems level data indicate that the probability of incarceration for people with mental illness cannot be predicted by A, the closure of psychiatric inpatient beds, B, changes in the organization and financing of public mental health services, or C, the availability of mental health services in the community. In fact, there is little evidence that the risk incarceration has uniquely increased for those with mental illness. Frank and Gliad, 2006, examined changes in the estimated living arrangements for people with serious and persistent mental illness, SPMI, in the USA from 1950 to 2000. During this period, the proportion of people with SPMI living in psychiatric institutions dropped by 23%, whereas the proportion living in correctional institutions rose only 4%. The rise in incarceration rates for those with SPMI follows a predictable pattern, remaining at 1% from 1950 to 1970, but rising to 3% by 1990 and 5% by 2000. As a function of get tough on crime policies, incarceration rates for the entire population most of whom do not have SPMI grew sharply in the 1980s and 1990s Bureau of Justice Statistics 2009. As Frank and Gliad 2006 conclude, it would be a mistake to attribute the increase in incarceration among people with SPMI directly to the experience of deinstitutionalization, page 128. Instead, the increase in this undesirable circumstance seems shared with the general population what is needed to shape more informative research and more effective interventions is an explicit conceptual framework that looks beyond mental illness as the principal cause of and solution to the problem of criminal justice involvement. Plausible alternatives to the criminalization hypotheses assume that ideology of criminal behavior largely is shared by offenders with and without mental illness. In the following text, we describe that these alternatives review evidence bearing on competing theories and offer an in integrative, integrative conceptual model that attempts to outline a path for future research and policy development. Because different processes may be involved, our model explicitly distinguishes between recidivism that involves new crimes and recidivism that may not. Available alternative theories and relevant evidence explaining criminal behavior. Theoretical alternatives to criminalization. There are two plausible general alternatives to criminalization hypothesis. First, criminogenical models emphasize emphasize uh, excuse me the individual's 
position in the criminal in the social hierarchy. Formal criminal genital theories pose different mechanic mechanisms, e.g. inadequate or harsh parental discipline, low self-control, crime. Godfrey Hershey, 1990, some of which are ele elegantly applied by Silver, 2006, to the link between mental illness and violence because specific theories lie beyond the scope of the present article. We focus on one broad criminal, criminogenical, criminological perspective. That is, people with mental illness engage in offending and other forms of deviant behavior, not because they have a mental disorder, but because they are poor. Their poverty situates them socially and geographically and places them at the risk of engaging in many of the same behaviors displayed by persons without mental illness who are similarly situated in settings that are rife with illicit substance substances, unemployment, crime, victimization, family breakdown, homelessness, health burdens, and a heavy concentration of other marginalized citizens. Second social personality psychology model focuses on individual and proximate risk factors for offending like antisocial cognition and criminals association associates. Um, a leading model suggests that criminal behavior largely is learned via early modeling and reinforcement patterns. Four major factors maintain ongoing criminal activity. An established history of benefiting from criminal activity, a social environment that encourages and tolerates criminal crime and criminals, personal attitudes and values supportive of criminal behavior, and a personality style that finds impulsive, high-risk behavior rewarding. Uh, opine, opine that the predictive validity of mental disorders for criminal justice involvement most likely reflects antisocial cognition, antisocial pa personality pattern, and substance abuse. Page 10. Reading between the lines, Andrews and his colleagues may assume that a third variable associated with mental illness, example, adverse social environments, increased exposure to modeling and reinforcement patterns that teach or program antisocial behavior. As will be shown, there is indirect evidence for both social, psychological, and criminological alternatives to the criminalization hypothesis. Summarizing effort evidence for theoretical alternatives, these alternatives are consistent with three bodies of evidence, indicating that major predictors of violence and recidivism are not unique with mental illness, but instead shared with general offenders. First, although the criminalization hypothesis persists that violence is typically the product of untreated psychosis or psychiatric deterioration in this population, available evidence suggests the opposite as a whole. A large body of research indicates that risk of violence is modest, modestly elevated for people with mental disorder, particularly those who misuse substances. Still, most people with mental illnesses are not violent. Most violent offenders are not mentally ill, and the strongest risk factors for violence, example, past violence, are shared by those with and without mental illness. Moreover, the link between psychosis and violence is particularly weak among offenders, perhaps because the base rate of violence is high and the strongest risk factors are well represented, leaving little room for the mod modest role that mental illness plays in other contexts. Based on the meta-analysis of 204 diverse studies and samples, Douglas Guy and Hart, 2009, found a small correlation between psychosis and violence, R equals 0 0.16, or equals 1.53. However, there was no meaningful correlation for offenders with mental illness, R equals 0 0.00, or equals, or OR equals 0 0.91, and general offenders, R equals 0 0.01, or OR equals 1.27. Second, there is little evidence that offenders with mental illness recidivate because of uncontrolled symptoms or other clinical factors. In a meta-analysis of 58 prospective studies of offenders with mental illness, 70% with schizophrenia, 
Monta et al. 1998, found that clinical variables, example, diagnosis, treatment, history, and did not meaningfully predict a new general offense, R equals zero, negative 0 0.02, or a new violent offense, R equals zero, negative 0 0.03. Instead, the strongest predictors of a new violent offense um, of R is larger than 0 0.20 were antisocial personality, juvenile delinquency, criminal history, and employment problems. Third, there are suggestions that this population disproportionate risk may be based on their having even more general risk factors for recidivism than their relatively healthy counterparts. The levels of service inventory, case management inventory, LS over CMI, Andrews, Bonta, and Wormuth, 2004, SS, eight will bust figure risk factors for recidivism. Based on a match sample of 221 parolees with and without mental illness, scheme ETL 2008, found that those with mental illness obtained significantly higher scores on the LSCMI N equals 0 0.20, particularly on the antisocial pattern subscale example, early or diverse criminal behavior criminal attitudes, pattern or generalized trouble, similarly based on a sample of 600 probationers, Gerd and Warmth, 2004, found that those with mental Ill health problems, N equals 169, obtained higher scores on the LSCMI than those without such problems. In turn, the LSCMI predicts recidivism equally well for those with and without mental illness. The latter findings are consistent with the social personality perspective that those these offenders are at risk not because they are mentally ill but because they are disproportionately experienced key factors example antisocial pattern that proponents believe establish and maintain ongoing criminal activity bonta etl 1998 however the social personality models mechanism remains opaque as there have been no direct investigations of whether disadvantaged environments or other third variable increase exposure of those with mental illness to modeling and reinforcement patterns that teach or program these key risk factors. Similarly, only one indirect evidence bears in the criminological perspective that those with mental illness offend because they are poor, which exposes them to risk factors and risky situations. That is, offenders with mental illness tend to live in a disadvantaged neighborhoods, be under or unemployed, have histories of victimization, abuse substances, and associate with people who have criminal histories, drink heavily, and use drugs. Although each of these variables has been linked to with criminal behavior, the extent to which they play a causal role has not been established. Why the criminalization hypotheses should not be discarded. The data reviewed thus far provide robust, if indirect, support for criminological and soci social personality models as alternatives to the criminalization hypothesis. That is, A, incarceration rates for this population cannot be explained by the availability of psychiatric services, but instead seem to have risen alongside those with offenders without mental illness as a function of get tough on crime policies. B, the strongest predictors of violence and crime are the same for the offenders with and without mental illness. And see, offenders with mental illness have more of these general risk factors than their relatively healthy counterparts. Nevertheless, the criminalization hypothesis remains viable as a component of the policy model. Why? Chiefly because there is evidence that criminal behavior is directly attributed to mental illness for a small subgroup of offenders Junginger, Claypool, Lairgo, and Christiana, 2006, conducted post-booking interviews with 113 arrestees with mental illness and co-occurring substance abuse disorder who were eligible for a jail diversion program. Raiders reviewed interview data and police reports to reliability, reliably rate the probability that mental illness caused the index offense. Direct and indirect effects were defined as the influence of delusions or hallucinations or any other programs or other symptoms. Example, 
confusion, depression, irritability. I'm sorry. Irritability, respectively, on the offense of the these offenders, 8% had been arrested for offenses that their psychiatric symptoms probably to do, definitely, excuse me, definitely caused either directly 4% or indirectly 4%. The authors conclude persons with a serious mental illness may be overrepresented in jails and prisons, but we can offer little evidence that it was their illness that got them there. Still, mental illness got some of them there. Similar results were obtained in a study of the crime patterns of deeper offenders. Peterson Scheme Heart and Vital 2009 study a match sample of 221 parolees with and without serious mental illness who had an advantage average of three prior arrests based on the interview data and review of parolees records writers reliably classified each offender into one of five patterns of offending the pattern of offending for the Vast majority of parolees, mental ill, 90% or not, 68% was reactive, reflecting trait anger and impulsivity. Only 5% of parolees with mental illness manifested a pattern that was attributed, attrib tri attrib attributable to psychotic symptoms, and only 2% fell in the disadvantage or survival crime group. Thus, although most had patterns of offending similar to those without mental illness, a minority 7% of the mentally ill sample clearly fit into fit the criminalization hypothesis. A similar process may describe the link between mental illness and violence for some psychiatric patients. Based on a sample of over 608 violent incidents, that involves psychiatric patients enrolled in the MacArthur Violence Risk Assessment Study. 11% were rated as having occurred while patients were delusional or hallucinating. Monahan, ETL, 2001, explaining other forms of recidivism. Beyond explaining the criminal behavior of a small minority of, of offenders with mental illness, the criminalization hypothesis may also help explain recidivism that occurs without criminal behavior in a broader population. Criminal justice involvement may deepen via revocation or reincarceration, even in the absence of new crimes and new victims. If the goal is to end criminal justice involvement, the policy model must take this form of failure into account. Applying the criminalization hypothesis, community supervision officers may attach a criminal label to deviant behavior by these offenders that permits inappropriate revocation of release. Although more research is needed, some evidence suggests that officers and judges apply lower <coughs> thresholds for revoking community supervision as a function of mental illness. Offenders both with and without mental illness are about equally likely to be rearrested for a new offense. However, these with mental illness are significantly more likely to commit technical violations and to have their community terms suspended or revoked. These observations are consistent with findings that correctional officers respond to conservatively to offenders with mental illness, perhaps out of fear or paternalism based on an experiment conducted with 264 probation officers who read case vignettes you know loudon uh, gillig and scheme 2009 found that mental illness particularly schizophrenia increased officers perceptions of violent risk and promoted plans to keep probationer under close surveillance and on a short leash ethnography suggests that reincarnation Serration sometimes is inappropriately used for parolees in emotional crisis. In one case, a psychotic parolee who disclosed suicidal thoughts was arrested and taken to the county jail for his own safety. Similarly, based on a sample of over 200 probationers with mental illness, Solemn and Drain, 1995, found that case managers often collaborated with probation officers to seek reincarceration on technical violation and jail-based treatments for those who were perceived. I'm sorry. 
perceived with, to be non-compliant with treatment. Together, these findings are consistent with the notion that some supervision failures reflect criminalization of mental illness rather than new crime. I'm going to pause here and I will finish this up. Um, uh, so this will be the end of part one for this article. So I'll be back for part two. Thank you.